Hello everyone. This hour on Verbling, the next in my great short story series. This is from Great Short Stories, our third class. This is Flannery O'Connor's Good Country People. We're going to, this is a very long story, so we're probably only going to get to the first third of the story today. We'll talk a bit about her background and hopefully learn some very interesting vocabulary and a little bit of culture. Well, if you want to know more about the culture of your second language and its literature, then Great Short Stories will do just that. We'll read classic English short stories in different genres from yesterday and today and participate in class discussions about their artistic, cultural, and social context. So that's a little bit about my class. Here's a little bit about me. I'm John Eric, your verbling teacher for this hour, and I'm an American teacher from New York hanging out from Lisbon, Portugal to bring you this class. And here are three quick rules to help you participate in my class. Remember to turn off, tune in, and open up. That means turn off your microphone, try to keep it off when you're not speaking. That way we can cut down on the background noise. If I tell you your connection sounds good, then feel free to keep it on. Rule two, tune in to the new words you're going to learn. Use them as actively as you can throughout the class. That way I can give you lots of feedback. The more feedback I give you, the more you'll learn about those words and how a native speaker uses them. Rule three is open up to your classmates. Relax and have fun. We're all here to learn. and This is a safe and respectful place to practice your English. Oh, and by the way, at the end of the class, I'll give you a whole series of links where you can get in touch with me. You can follow me on Verbling, read a tweet, chat with me on Facebook or Google+, see a class on my YouTube channel, or even schedule a private class with me. So, that's a bit about me. Ooh, let's see. Oh, I didn't realize I looked so bad. <laughs> now I know. Let's say hello to Sabina. How are you, Sabina? You can turn your mic back on. Thanks, teacher. I'm well. Teacher, Sabina, you're the teacher. I thought we went through <laughs> this already. You're the teacher, and I am your humble servant. Sabina, it's let me, not true. It is true. Have you ever? Have you ever? Uh, do you know? Not have you ever, but do you know uh, Flannery O'Connor, the writer? She's a, a writer from a long no, time ago. No, I think no. Okay, well. I want you to... I didn't hear about him. About her. Hello? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Now oh, okay. I can hear you. There we go. So you didn't hear about her. Not about him, about her. She's a writer from... So she's a woman. She is a woman. Well, she was a woman. She is, she is an old writer. Um, I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, this, this story is long, so I've been trying to get the text in order quickly. So I didn't have a lot of time to prepare anything extra. Um, but just give me a quick second here, because maybe, maybe I can give you a little bit of background before we read. Give me just a second here. It's, it, it took so long to get the, the text. I'm still not finished editing the text because this is a, a lot longer than I a lot longer than I had thought it would be. Give me just a second here. I'm going to try just quickly to Google for something. If I can get it, if I can get it, then I can give you. No, don't have it. Hmm. Nope. Well, let me see if I can just go to Wikipedia then.
All right. Oh, because I have... Um... Ah, okay, I do have something here. This is what I want to show you. But I wonder if I have... I just have a little biography. Um, yeah, let's take a quick look. What I could do... Let's just see here. Sorry, it's, I, I, I tried to prepare something before the text, but it was just taking too long. But what I can do here is just read you a little bit of our biography, just so you know what we're going to be dealing with. Um, so I'll tell you what, I'm going to just be sharing from a website that has a, a brief biography here. Let's take a look. And I can give you, I'll put the link uh, later. <clears throat> Flannery O'Connor died in 1964 at the age of 39. She died at 39. For years after her untimely death, uh, the mis let me see. Hopefully you can see the screen where I am. Let me go back here. For years after her untimely death, the myth surrounding O'Connor was that she had been a shy, uh, eccentric recluse confined to a rural farm in Georgia. Actually, I thought that was true. <laughs> Apparently, it's not. Do you understand what, what this means? A recluse. Yes, I can understand, yes. Um, okay, well, the biography says that's not true. Flannery O'Connor died indeed, died, did indeed spend the last third of her short life on her mother's farm, but only because she suffered from a debilitating form of lupus that made it difficult to care for herself. And yeah, she was a little odd. She raised chickens and peacocks for fun and said whatever was on her mind, regardless of how it sounded to others. But she wasn't a recluse. She stayed actively engaged with the world outside the farm, writing hundreds of letters to her many friends and associates and her writing. Um, this is kind of important because we're going to be reading the beginning of the story, which has to do with a girl on a farm. So you can decide how autobiographical this is. Miss O'Connor's style is light, is sorry, is tight, tight to choking, as it is direct and uncompounded, as the as the order to a firing squad to shoot a man against a wall wrote the New York Times when her first novel appeared to critical acclaim in 1952. Her short, her short story, her stories were ruthless in their realistic detail and insistence that the reader pay attention, no matter how grotesque the action. Horrible things happen <laughs> in Flannery O'Connor's stories. Uh, we don't have to worry about that part. Let me jump down to the next part. Flannery O'Connor wrote like a person, this is down here, were like a person who did not have time to mess around. She certainly didn't. At the age of 25, she was diagnosed with the same form of lupus that had already killed her father. At the time, there was no effective treatment or cure. She lived another 14 years enduring pain, painful and difficult medical, medical procedures with her wry sense of humor and self, wry sense of self-depreciating humor. My lupus has no business in literary considerations, she once said, sharply rebuking the idea that she deserves special treatment because of her illness. Um, okay, and just one last part down here. We'll, we'll, then we'll, we'll move on. A Roman Catholic. Well, that's what Americans call uh, European Catholicism, a Roman Catholic. So, in other words, Catholic. Um, Flannery O'Connor insisted that she was at heart a Christian writer and that all of her stories were in one way or another related to the life of Christ. Her religious, their religious themes could be difficult for the average reader to spot. She detested, oh this doesn't matter, she detested uh, Carson uh, McCullers, McCullers, Tennessee Williams, 
and her fellow and her fellow Southern Gothics. She was uninterested in the civil rights movement or politics. I wonder if that's true. When she painted her self-portrait, she included her favorite peacock. There was no one else quite like Flannery O'Connor, and there hasn't been anyone like her since. Okay, so this is kind of a biased. <laughs> this is a bit of a biased biography, but it gives you it gives you some idea. So these are all themes that are kind of important to her writing. That's why I'm I'm bringing it up. Um, so why do you think it? Why do you think it might be important that they're stating she's a Catholic? She's from she's from the South in Georgia, right? Um, do you know what most people what the religion is in the South in the United States? Or most people, especially at that time in the twenties and thirties. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, is Catholicism. that a no or yes? Yes. In the South, we call it the, we call it the Bible Belt, the Bible Belt, and that means that uh, it has a reputation of people going around and thumping a Bible, you know, for dramatic effects because there are evangelists. So definitely not Catholic. Uh, this is uh, uh, the Bible Belt is evangelical. So Baptists, what they call born again Christians, it's kind of important because she's not she's not from that tradition. So she already stands out. She's already different than the rest. And so there, uh, the stereotype is that they're quite against Catholicism because. Uh, for various reasons, uh, they don't want to be part of. Part of it is a very American. The idea that you're not going to be told what to do by by the Vatican is part of the reason. But it doesn't matter. The point is, she's already different. She's religious, but she's really different than the than the prevailing religion in the area. Even though it's Christian, it's a different kind of uh, Christianity. It's kind of important. Also. Illness is kind of important because she wrote. Uh, she was a pretty acclaimed writer, and she started young and she finished young because she passed away early. So it's also kind of important to keep in mind. Uh, what else did I want to say? I think that was basically it. I don't know if there's anything else I wanted to say. Uh, yeah. All right. Well. So what I want you to do is we're going to try to get through the first part of the story and see how clear it is. And I want you, uh, as we go along, to sort of guess what you think is going to happen based on some clues. And we'll identify them as we go along. Um, and we'll see how these themes come back. This is not literature class. This is English class. So I don't expect you to to be too analytical. I'll try to help you understand the nuance. But it might be a good idea to keep in mind some of those things we talked about, like where she lives, the fact that she's different, uh, the difference between Catholicism and uh, and baptism or, or the evangelical uh, religions of the area, and the time period is t as well. So. Hopefully, all of that will help you make some sense of the story too. So, I put the I put the the text document in the chat window. Can you both see it? Yes, I have opened it. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So we're going to try to read this. Let me go. There you go. Okay, so when you get it on screen, it will look like this. I don't have any graphics for this one because it took so long to get the text into the document, I didn't have time to do anything else. But I'll fix it up for the next class. All right. So, this is going to be long, <laughs> but let's give it a shot. Uh, what do you think? Um, so, hang on just a second here. All right. So, Sabina, why don't you try the first paragraph? 
and we'll see where we are after that. Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Besides the neutral expression that she wore when she was alone, Mrs. Freeman had two <laughs> others, forward and reverse, that she used for all her human dealings. Her forward expression was steady and driving like the advance of a heavy truck. Her eyes never swerved to left or right, but turned as the story turned, as if they followed a yellow line down the center of it. She seldom used the, the other expression because it was not often necessary for her to react to statement. But when she did, her face came to a complete stop. There was an almost imperceptible movement of her black eyes during which they seemed to be receding. And then the observer would see that Mrs. Freeman thought she might stand there as a real as several grain sacks thrown on top of each other was no longer there in spirit. As for getting, as for getting anything across to her when this was the case, Mrs. Hopewell had given it up. She might talk her head off. Mrs. Freeman could never be brought to admit herself wrong to any point. She would stand there and if she could be brought to say anything, it was something like, well, I wouldn't have said it was, and I wouldn't have said it wasn't, or letting her gaze range over the top kitchen shelf where there was an assortment of dusty bottles, she might remark. I see you ain't ate many of them fix you put up last summer. Yeah, let's listen to that line, the last line, because this tells you where they're living. Uh, I'll put it like this. I see you ain't eight many of them things you put up last summer. <laughs> the verb eight. So this this tells you where they're from. They're from the south because they say, I see you ain't. Do you know that word? Have you heard that before? Uh, no. I haven't see, does I it have seen it. Does it sound it like English? Somewhere, but Not the English that I know. <laughs> exactly. So instead of saying isn't or aren't, have it's a not aren't. No, it's, instead of saying isn't or aren't, they'll say ain't, which don't even ask me what it what it stands for <laughs> because I don't know. But it means isn't or aren't. So or 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 didn't. Or wouldn't it be eaten after eaten instead of a. So it should be no. It should be. I see you. I see you haven't eaten. I suppose that's it. Yeah, I see you haven't eaten many of those figs uh, that you planted last summer. I suppose it's that, but it comes out. I see you ain't. I see you ain't eight. Ain't eight. So this is like south, you know, southern dialect. Um. Okay. So. It's a, I, I don't know how clear this is. This is a very literary. It's, it's not, I don't think it's that difficult to follow the language, but it's a very literary descriptive passage. So. Yes, John, but I don't know what figs are. Figs. Like, like, uh, it's the same in Italian, I think. Figus. Figus. You say. Ah, okay. Fig. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Figs. Uh, like Luis Figo. <laughs> uh, what what do you think Mrs. Freeman is like based on the description? I mean, is this a flattering? I think that she picture? never show her. I think that she never show she think she because she. Mm, uh, doesn't change the expression on her face, so maybe it's difficult to understand what she's thinking. Okay, so one thing is about what she really thinks, right? Another thing is that, let's take a quick look here. Another thing in the text is it says she might talk her head off, right? As for as for getting anything across to her, well, 
Now we have to go back a little bit, sorry. So, Mrs. Freeman, though she might stand there, as real as several sacks of grain thrown on top of each other. So Maybe as, she's, <laughs> she's present with her body, but not with her mind. Yeah, 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 because she's no longer there in spirit. So even though she's standing there, just like several sacks sitting there in, those, in the corner, right? Something big and heavy taking up space. She's no longer there in spirit. And as for, any, as for getting anything across to her, as for communicating with her when she was in, when, when this was the case, Mrs. Hopewell had given it up. So we've got Mrs. Freeman and Mrs. Hopewell together. She might talk her head off. Mrs. Freeman could never be brought to admit herself wrong to any point. So she could never admit, this is a little bit, the way it's written is maybe a bit confusing. Mrs. Freeman could never be brought to admit herself wrong to any point. So was Mrs. Freeman wrong ever? It's a uh, it's a she supposed herself to be right at any yeah, time, e maybe. E even if she was wrong, right, she would she would insist that she was right. So she's a stubborn person, uh, and she would she would stand there, and if she could be brought to say anything, it was something like, "Well, I wouldn't have said it if it was, and I wouldn't have said it if it wasn't." So she's kind of She's kind of opaque. Uh, what else do I want to say? Okay, so we've got two people, and one of them is described in not the most flattering terms. Oh, by the way, one little, little thing on the top of the text. It says that her forward expression was steady and driving like the advance of a heavy truck. Steady and driving like the advance of a heavy truck. Uh, and then it goes on to say some to describe her like a truck her eyes never swerved does that make sense when 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 we're driving when might we swerve uh, maybe they she moved uh, her eyes uh, um, in a certain way Right, swerving is to move in a sudden in a, in a sudden way. So her eyes never swerved, never swerved to the right or the left, just like a truck coming at you, not going not not going to the right or left, but going quickly, you know, heading toward you. This big heavy truck, but turned as the story turned. You know, it's hard to control a truck; they're big, so you have to you have to you have to make these really wide turns because they're so heavy. So her expression would turn as the story turned, as if they followed a yellow line down the center of it. This is a great description because you get the idea of what she's like and and the and the metaphor is not in it's not something that most people would use. It's quite unusual. So you can already see that her style is somehow really concrete but unusual. We know what a truck is like, but we wouldn't expect a little woman in the South to, to be described like a truck. It's not how she looks physically, it's her, her mentality. So she'll follow the story very slowly, like a truck, as if there's a line down the center of the story. Right? It's a, it's a little hard to follow, I think, at first, but I think if we bear with it, it'll make some sense. All right. So, Let's see what happens next. We've got Mrs. Freeman and we've got Mrs. Hopewell. Let's see if we can start to figure out who they are. So Giuseppe, want to take the second paragraph for us? Yeah. They, carry on, they carried on their most important business in the kitchen at breakfast. Every morning, Mrs. Hopewell got, got up at 7 o'clock and lit her gas eater and Joyce. Joy was her daughter. A large blonde girl who had an artificial leg. Mrs. Hopewell photo photo wears as a, a child of fro uh, do, do, um, no. do, do. She was uh, 32 years old 
and uh, highly educated. Okay, keep this line in mind as you read the story. It's important. <laughs> she's 32 and highly educated, but Mrs. Hopewell thinks she's a child. It's important. Go ahead. Joy, um, uh, sorry, Mr. Hopewell photos. Okay. Joy, Joy would, would get uh, up yeah. while her mother was eating and the lumber into the bathroom and slammed the door. And before long, Miss, Mrs. Freeman would arrive at the back door. Joy would hear her mother call, come on in. And then they would, they would talk for a, a while in low voices that were indistinguishable, indistin indistinguishable in the bathroom. By the time Joe came in, came in. They had usually finished it, the weather report and wait, they were wait, on. Finish it or finished? Finished. Right. So finished it, the weather report and they were on one or the other over Miss Miss Freeman's daughters. Mrs. Mrs. When you say M S it's Ms. M I S S Miss M R S Mrs. Ms. So we got three three titles for women, and this is one that means that she's married. Mrs. Mrs. Freeman's daughters. Yeah, Mrs. Glenis or Caramel. Caramel. Joe Caramel, called. I guess. Caramel. Joe called them glycerin and the caramel. <laughs> 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 Glynis, a redhead, was 18 and had many admi admirers. Caramea, a blonde, was only 15 but already married and pregnant. Yeah, why she not? Could not she <laughs> could not. Why not be married and pregnant when you're 15? <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, you burn up uh, the life. Well, doesn't matter. She could not, she could not keep anything on her stomach. Every morning, Mrs. Freeman told Mrs. Hope how many times she, she had vomited since the last report. Right. So, what do you think about breakfast in their house? Would you want to be part of their little breakfast ritual? Does it sound fun? Uh... So they're, they're yeah. describing they're describing their typical morning, right? They carried on their business. Their, sorry, they carried on their most important business in the kitchen at breakfast. So this this is painting a picture of what a, a, a what daily breakfast was like, right? So now we've got th we've got three characters: Mrs. Hopewell, uh, Mrs. Freeman, and Joy. Uh, and then we've got these two daughters. So, who belongs to whom? Joy is the daughter of who? Just, just to make sure it's clear. Joy is whose daughter? Yeah. Uh, Joy is the the daughter's the, the Mrs. Hopewell's daughter. Right. Joy is Mrs. Hopewell's daughter. And is Joy unusual in any way? Joy is it usually? Is she unusual in any way? Yes, she is. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, she is. <laughs> she's unusual because she's only got one leg. Ah, yeah, because uh, she has an handicap. Uh, right. She so has she has, she has, she has one artificial leg and one real leg. So she's quite unusual. In the South, in the 1920s and 30s. This was the, you know, this is what this is what half of 20th century literature was about. At that time, everyone was writing about the transition. Whether it was obvious or not, people were writing about the transition from slavery to modern society, from the old ways and the and the big families and plantations and the old way of life to trying to modernize or trying to adapt or cope with modernization. It was called modernism, and even uh, even even the way they wrote was was about modernizing the language. So and also capturing something from the past. So 
we read Hemingway in the first uh, great short story class, first and second. He's one of those writers. Okay, he's not from the South, but he's still one of those modernist writers. Uh, and then you hear Faulkner is another one who wrote all about the South and the mythology of the South. Why is it important? It's important not because it's about the South or about uh, or about this evangelical way of looking at the world through you know these kind of religions. Or uh, also, Tennessee Williams is another one. Maybe we can read something. Yeah, there's definitely a short story we should read by Tennessee Williams. But it's important because. Um, it's like this transition from the 19th century and from the old order of things to the 20th century to all the, the changes that are occurring and going to occur uh, and how they impacted this old way of life, this traditional sort of American traditional way of life going back to, you know, like the revolution. So they're still trying to cope with the Civil War and it's already, you know, at the middle of the 20th century. So, uh, all of that is there in the background in these stories somewhere, even if it's not directly there. So, in the 19... Sorry, anyway, I'm saying that because, um, you know, they used to marry their daughters off to important families, and the big families would stay together. Well, if you've got a daughter who's large and has an artificial leg, she's probably not going to marry into an important family. <laughs> so she already feels very, you know, she already feels very conspicuous and self-conscious on top of everything else. And uh, probably that's why she's highly educated. She's probably rebelling in some way because she doesn't fit the stereotype. So I want to say that because it's kind of important to understand the background. Um, do you like movies, Giuseppe? Do you like movies? Yes, yes. So, remember remember when you were a kid and you had to watch all those classic Italian movies? Remember that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> remember remember uh remember Lucino Visconti's movie uh Rocco e sui fratelli. Remember the one by Visconti? The black and white one with Alain Delon from 1962. Remember that one, Giuseppe? Um, Just say to, yes. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I can say no because uh, <laughs> you have to I say never, yes. I never see that kind of film. That can that. Oh kind of my movies. god! But you it's know, a classic Italian with, movie. Uh, modern guy. Yeah, yeah, but but you can't be modern without knowing where you came from. So you have to watch those movies. It's a decadence. <laughs> it's true. But did you, did you see that film in particular, Rocco and his brothers? You no. maybe, maybe I I watched. I I um, when I was young, I watched uh, almost all Visconti's films. So I, you you you, pro you definitely saw this one. But I uh, I can't remember. It's a, it's a classic. It's a white, it's a white but I'm bringing black, it black film. Yeah. No? Black and white. Black and white. What did you say? Black and white. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's from 1962 or 63, and it has, I think, it's Alan Delon, is, I think it's his first big movie. It's I think early it's his first. Films, yeah? Early film. Oh, it's what, what, it's, it's the, the, the second or third film by Visconti. Uh, I think it's the third, if I remember right. But it's the first film. <clears throat> anyway, I'm bringing it up because... It's very much like this short story, not not the plot, but the but the idea. Uh, it's all about people from where you're from, uh, Giuseppe. It's about people from not Sicily but the south, who are forced to move north just to survive uh, after it's after the war. So they're forced to move north, and it's sort of like so, uh, they they immigrated. Exactly, it immigrated, but inside of Italy, right? So they had to. So they're from the south. I don't think they're from the islands, but they're from somewhere in the south, and they have to go to Milan and try to cope with this new modern life that they're not used to. And uh, it's it's also the first film, so it's just like the themes. It's very much like the themes of this classic 20th century writing. People 
trying to transition from the past and the old way of life to urban life and 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 uh, and it's not explicit but life after World War two as well it's not exactly explicit but part of that modernization is is how drastically the world changed how drastically technology changed you've got all these old people not old people young people but from the old order of life who don't know how to handle it yet it's all very new uh, so it's a good film because it kind of reminds me it's the same theme just happening in Italy so it's like another perspective uh, and it's also the first film where he starts to use opera as uh, he starts to make these operatic films I think his film uh, many of his uh, Visconti film reflect the his commitment to social Problem, social issues. So, it's true. Yeah, I he, think, uh, he, he had a lot of money, so I don't know what I think <laughs> about it. I don't know what I think about his commitment, because uh, he seemed like a real jerk. <laughs> He's, yeah, he seemed like a real jerk, to be uh, honest with you. There's, a, there's. I don't know. I don't know if it. Oh, he's yes. he's a he's a cinematic master. There's no yes. doubt about it. So, <laughs> but there's a there's a great story. There's a great story that instead of paying the the uh, the the actors in in the film, he gave them uh, little trinkets, little little memorabilia. There's a story that when he was making his classic neorealist film, um, oh, what is it called? Uh, that's in Venice, no? No? No, no, no much yes, earlier. Venice is the most, uh, most famous film. Leopard. Yeah, yeah. No? No. No, no, no. I much, much, much know. earlier. Much earlier. It's Obsession. like his second film. Obsession. No, it's the one, no? the one after that. The one after that. Uh, I don't he remember. Made, he made it. Just. Oh. It's the one about the fishermen. Uh, and he, he shot um, it on location using real fishermen. And they weren't actors. He used real people. It was like his, it was like his version of a neorealist film, because he was inspired by De Sica and by Rossellini. So he made his own neorealist film. Uh, I just forgot the name of it. La, la, la Terra Trema. That's what it was. La Terra Trema. La Terra Trema. What does that mean? What does that mean in English? You know. Uh... The the half uh, is a uh, crawling is a uh, earthquake. It's earthquake. Yeah. Earthquake, right? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Is that right? So did you chance? I wasn't sure if it was. So because I it's. I wasn't sure if it was literal or it's it's earthquake. In other words, earthquake in English, not the earth shakes, trema shakes. It's mm. earthquake, right? Um, I, so, tre trema means uh, uh, shudder, tremble, shake. Yeah, that's what I thought. Uh -huh. So, but if you say earthquake, isn't that a different word? Because we earthquake say we uh, say means uh, terremoto. It's uh, terremoto, right? Terremoto. Oh, okay, okay. So it's like the earth shakes or the earth shaking, yeah. something like that. I so I think it's that movie. There's a famous. I, I, I don't know that view. There's there's a there's a story that instead of paying the fishermen, uh, he gave them little heirlooms and trinkets from his estate, like like handkerchiefs with the Visconti name embroidered in them. You know. So, what are you going to do with a silk handkerchief if you're a fisherman in the south of Italy. <laughs> I don't know. So it seems like he, he on one hand, he, he, he made very beautiful films and he, he, he was a dedicated communist, uh, you know, with all of these themes about revolution and all of the great stuff. And he was into Gramsci and the communist theorists and all of that. Great. Wonderful. But at the same time, I don't know. I don't know what I think about him on a personal level, but his films are unparalleled, absolutely. He also made one of the greatest color films in the history of cinema, which was Senso. Uh, and you have to see the film, you really need to see the film on film to, to, to appreciate it, because 
if you see it anywhere else, the colors are desaturated. Uh, all the transfers that were done 20, 30 years ago, they don't. They, you lose the color. You have to really see it on film to see how extraordinary the film is. And I if I remember right, it was restored. Okay, anyway, sorry about that aside. I just wanted to bring it up because you can compare these stories to things that are happening in your own country. There's probably very similar themes. So that's why I mentioned Visconti, his early films, very similar themes to these American writers. And in fact, Ossessione, the first film, was based on an American film. It was based on um, The Postman Always Rings Twice. It was an adaptation of an American oh. film noir. A postman Rings Twice. Yeah. Right. So it was okay, an adaptation a... in, into, into Italian culture of a, of, a really, of a Raymond Chandler novel, a really strong American themed novel. Mm. So there you go. <laughs> so that's why you came to class to hear a lecture about American culture, right? Just say yes. Say say yeah. yes, Sabina. Yes. 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 <laughs> okay. If you want me to shut up, just but tell I'm me to learning shut up. more about Italian culture. <laughs> oh, okay, good. I don't know anything about Italian culture. I just know about a few films. That's it. Um, okay, Yuki, why don't you take? Paragraph three, and I won't interrupt. We're going to see if we can do maybe three more paragraphs because we need to get a head start. This is a long story. Can you take okay. number three for us, Mr. Hopewell? I'd like to do Mr. or Mrs. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Mrs. Hopewell. They like to tell people that that Gibbs Guinness and Caramel. I think it's. Uh, Glenise, I think it's Glenise and yeah. Carame. I think it's Glenise and Carame. These are names that you will never hear in the north, like where I'm from. You're not going to go to New York City and hear and hear of people called Glenise and Carame. This is southern, <laughs> deep southern culture. And I think, let me just ask you a question. Before, sorry to interrupt. Why do you think Joy calls them glycerin and caramel? <laughs> what do you think she means by that? Why do you think she's making fun of the names? Uh, I have no idea. By the way, I've 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 got I I've got to say something else. Her name is Joy. Do you think that's ironic in any way? Does she seem like a joyful person, Giuseppe? Does Joy seem very joyful to you? Yeah, sounds uh, funny. Uh, as well, uh, Caramia and Glynis. I think uh, he would. Uh, he wants. Uh, he wanted. Uh, wanted uh, name name uh, his daughters in that way, because it uh, sounds sweet. For me, maybe sweet. <laughs> and Joy, so. Joy. The, the person named Joy has an artificial leg. And she stands out, and she's and she's she speaks her mind. So she sounds like anything but a joy. So it sounds very ironic in the story. And she's making fun of the of the daughters of, of Mrs. Freeman. So instead of calling them Glenise and Caramel, she calls them uh, glycerin and caramel, which implies something you know caramel, something overly sweet. So she sounds like she's being very sarcastic. So Joy seems like a very sarcastic person. So and maybe, maybe also that. May Go ahead, yeah. She she want uh, he want to show up uh, something. She wants uh, to um, to show up uh, appear as a highly qualified. As I don't know, highly important. So, yeah, well, yeah. I don't know if he, She's condescending. Is that what you mean? She's a little bit yeah. condescending. Yeah, I think she's making fun of, of the of the names. I have a feeling that she thinks the names are very pretentious, and this is some kind of this is not the way we, we we've we've gotten beyond these titles and crazy names. And now people are named normal things. So I think she's making fun of it. Joy, that is. I think Joy's making fun of the names. She thinks they're pretentious. Okay, go ahead, Yuki. Sorry to interrupt. 
uh, Gurini, Gurini and Caramel were two of the two of the fine, finest girls. Finest. Sorry, two of the finest girls she knew, and and that Mr. Freeman was a lady, and that she was never ashamed to take her anywhere or introduce her to everybody. To anybody. Anybody they might meet. Then she would tell how she had happened to hire the Freemans in the first place, and how they were a godsend to her, to her, and how she had ha had them for years. The reason for her keeping them for long, so long was that was that they were not trash. They were good to. They are, they are good country people. She had telephoned the, the man whose name they had given as a reference, and he, he had told, the, told her that Mr. Freeman was a good farmer, and that, that his wife was uh, the no, noisiest woman, woman, even to walk, walk the earth. She'd got to be into everything. The, the man said, if she don't get there before the dust settled, settles, you can bet she, she's dead. That's all. She'll want to know all your business. I can stand him real good, he had said. But me, no, my wife neither could have stood that, that woman one, one more minute on this place. That had put Miss, Mrs. Hopewell of or Mrs. Hopewell off for a few days. Okay. What when we when we're <coughs> when we're put off, when we're put off. Do we like something? When we're put off, if I'm if I'm put off from like some kind of food, I don't know. If I'm put off, would I eat that kind of food? Let's say. I had bad eggs, so then after that I'm put off from eggs. So will I keep eating eggs? A boy meat, maybe. Yeah. No, no, it doesn't mean no. that. It just means not so severe. It just means that you don't feel like it anymore. You're uh, somehow disgusted by it. I uh, so feel bad. Yeah. Feel bad, right? So, so that that made Mrs. Hopewell a little bit disgusted. Let's be clear what, what's going on here. <clears throat> Does anyone, what, first of all, two words in bold, godsend and trash. Uh, what do you think? What could we use to substitute for the word godsend? Because that might not be a word you know. Forget about the word god, it doesn't matter. Godsend to the happy, maybe. Yeah, but it's a happy noun. Happy. It's a noun because it's a uh, godsend. Present from... From God, no. It it means a present from God, literally, literally. Mm. But here in the paragraph, it's it's just the idea of something really good, like the best thing in the world. Because it says, then she would she would tell how she happened to hire the Freemans in the first place, and how they were a godsend. If someone or something is a godsend, it's the best. The best thing that could ever happen. It's a God, like a gift from God. So a gift, important, good gift. And the reason for keeping them was that they were not trash. They were good country people. So guess what? According to Mrs. Hopewell, if you're not good country people, you're trash. That's an important point. <laughs> if you're not good country people, you're trash. What does she think about people from, let's say, New York or Boston? What do you, what do you think she would call people from the north? What do you think, Yuki? What would she call someone like me? Uh, she 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 don't like to touch people. Yeah, yeah. she would if if she met me, she, she would call me trash. She she think she think they are they are quite messy and. Um, like a trash. <laughs> <laughs> messy, I don't know about messy. Mm. But the word good here, the word good is important because when say good in the south, in this 
this style of writing which is very conscious of the culture of the South, especially at that time. Good means Christian good. Good oh. in the evangelical Christian way. So good country people is what they would say, but it has a lot of meaning behind it. You have to be like us. If you're not like us, you're nothing. If you're not like us, you're trash. So we already have this strange idea that on one hand there are very, very devout Christians. On the other hand, if you're not like us, you're no good, meaning you're going to hell. All of that is there in the text. It's not explicit, but it's there. And um, so I think that this story is talking about hypocrisy. And I think that's ultimately what we're getting to. But it doesn't matter because it's not done. It's not done in a preachy way. It's not done. It's not even obvious. But the story is actually, uh, I think it's one of the funniest stories ever written. I think it's a comedy, personally. Mm -hmm. That's me. <laughs> it's horrible, but it's also All funny. the characters in this story is described as, as a hypocrite, uh, but joy. Yeah? Are described as what? Uh, described, described as a, as a, as a hypocrite. Hypocrite. Hi hypocrite. Well, let's 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 hold on. To, let, let's hold on to that idea because that's a good point. Let's 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 ask that as a question as we read. Yuki, let's 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 ask that as a question as we read. Are all the characters hypocrites except Joy? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Is Joy any different than the people that she's being condescending to? Is she any different at all? Let's find out. That's a good point. Hey, let me just ask you a quick question here. Uh, in the next hour, I was going to do the, the business class, but this story is so long, we're going to need at least two, maybe three classes to read it. So I'm just wondering if... Uh, what should I do? Should I do the business class or should I change it uh, to do to continue with the short story? Because I'm not sure. Or, or will you be back next week to keep reading? I'm just curious. What do you think is the best thing to do? Because in the next hour, I'm looking how many people. In the, in the next hour, nobody, nobody has reserved my class for the business class. So I could just change it and we could keep reading the story if you want. What I do you think? Other, other, other I, students. I cannot attend the hour. You can't come next hour? I cannot attend the class next hour. No, because okay. I have a, a, the math with the children, so I, I go there. Ah, okay, okay. There is a math okay. this morning with the children in the church. There's a math today. So you're reading the right story. You're learning all about religion in America <laughs> before you go to church. Let's go. <laughs> I prefer to go to the church. Yes, but this morning they'll sing a lot of uh, Christmas songs, so I have to go. <laughs> it's a good thing. All right. So it sounds like we'll, we'll be doing we'll be doing business, I'll, and we'll we'll come I'll back doing, to the short I'll story next, next week. week. I'll join next Oh, I've got one person. Yeah, so one is better than zero. I'll Let me ask I'll one more question. If, you <laughs> if, if you've got other things to do, just go about your business. Don't worry story. about me. Um, let me but just ask a quick question. Just a quick question. Uh, I'm trying to post updates in Google Plus and Facebook about my classes. But today, I didn't have time to do it because yesterday was very, 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 very busy. Um, do you guys see the posts when I post them? And if you see them, do you see them on Facebook or Google Plus? So when I, when, I, when, I, when I announce a class, do you get the message ever? Mm -hmm. Yesterday, uh, yes. today I, I didn't see. Today, I didn't do it. I didn't, I didn't have time. Today, I didn't do it. But do you guys, no, no, when I say guys, that means guys so, and girls. Sometimes I, I, I check your page, of course. But do you don't get an automatic notification? Uh, yes, I, I, I have. Yes, I have uh, on my page uh, your no notification. Yes. In I, which? I re receive. Facebook or Google Plus? Uh, Google Plus. I, I don't have a Facebook page. I only have a Google Plus, so I check Google, Google Plus. Google uh, Plus, yes. 
and the notification from your page. Okay, so you do get notified. Yes. Are you because um, I, I I I created a new page just for Verbling. I know I think you joined Yuki already, but uh, there's a new page just for Verbling on Google Plus because uh. I can't make posts to the main Google Plus page. It's it takes too many steps, so I created a special page. Okay. So, just uh, okay. I just wanted I was just curious because it seems like if I don't. If I don't advertise the class, I have much lower attendance. But I'm not sure if, I, if everyone is seeing the advertisements. I register your new page. Okay, don't worry. Yours, you, I remember seeing you there. By the way, um, okay. All right, so we have to stop the class and start the business class. But just remember, everyone, if you if you if you can join, if you're on Google Plus, try to join. I'll put the link here. Hang on just a second. Try to join the John Eric Verbling, the, the newsfeed page, the John Eric Verbling page, which is, if I put the link there, whoops, it's the, it's the link that says feed, newsfeed, Google Plus, because that's where I'm pasting, that's where I'm posting all the announcements, just so you know. Okay, so we're going to stop here for today. And oh, 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 sorry, so, sorry about that. Sorry about that. I was getting feedback. So Sabina, when are you going to be back so we can continue with the story next week? Will you be around? Oh, I really don't know because in the morning I usually work. So. But next week uh, is today holidays. I, Yes, I'm working on Monday and Tuesday, in the morning, Tuesday. And mm -hmm. I'll be at home uh, at Christmas and the day after Christmas. And then I'll be back to All work. Right. So, maybe, so what, if we, what if we do the story on Christmas and the day after Christmas? On Christmas, I'm at home, so I could attend the class. The day after, I won't be it's at home because... I okay. I have well, the, the lunch with my well, parents-in-law. But at Christmas, okay. I'm not Well, what do you I'm think? Is, is Christmas okay for you, Giuseppe? Will you be Will you be getting presents on Christmas? Oh. <laughs> 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 um, or should I do something special for Christmas? No, I don't know. We are just stay at home. Uh, we're um, in. In Christmas days, Christmas event, uh, usually we stay at home and uh, we have parents. All right. Well, if I schedule this, this because this is the long, a long story. If I schedule it for Christmas, would that be good, or you're going to be busy? For me, it'll be good. For you, Giuseppe? Do you have an hour on Christmas or no? Twenty-five, fifty, not the Christmas. Uh, in the, or in the morning, Russia, I, so. can, I can attend the class. So not for you. Oh, for me, yes, uh, I can, I can, I can, I can uh, attend the class. Okay, it's a at, deal. At, Christmas. Uh, these hours. Okay, Christmas. We're gonna we're gonna do the next installment of Good Country People. That's what we're it, reading. It doesn't matter for me. <laughs> and if it's not a Christmas here in Russia, I didn't, and it's it and it's not a Buddhist holiday either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. So so come back next. Come back on Christmas, and we'll do the next part of the, of the story. Okay, okay I've got to stop because I'm seven minutes late for the next class, as always. So see you in a minute if you're coming back, and we'll pick up on our business okay. class. See you next time. Wish you, wish you a happy Christmas, Sabine. You. <laughs> happy Christmas bye bye. to you too. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. Goodbye. Bye bye. Goodbye. Bye bye.